Good morning, good morning, good morning, CLS. How are you guys doing this morning? Oh man, come on, you guys. There should be some pent up energy in you guys from not having chapel last week. So let's try that again. Mr. Hughes, don't disappoint because we know that you have the loudest mouth in here. So, CLS, how are you doing today? All right, let's rise up. We are going to be worshiping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Everybody to your feet. The Word of God says that everything that has breath must praise the Lord. Amen? And so we are going to worship God with everything that's within us. We are going to exalt the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Are you guys with me? All right, guys, lay it out before him. Let's worship. So great a mercy, what heart 
we're so grateful, we're so thankful that we can live in a time when the name of Jesus holds power and holds authority to break every chain. And God, we fully surrender ourselves to you, Jesus. We fully give ourselves to you, God. Jesus, you are so good. And even though you are good and we don't have to ask this, we choose to, God, because you are worthy of it and it's pleasing to you. Our praise is honoring to you, God. It is pleasing to you when we praise you as your people. So God, we ask that you would come and break every chain in this room. That the depression would bow, that anxiety would bow, that every single thing that grips us in our lives would bow, that fear would bow in the name of Jesus and have no place in our hearts. It has no place in us as sons and daughters of you, God. You bring deliverance. You bring freedom. You bring peace. You bring love that is unlike anything the world can offer us. The world cannot offer us anything in comparison to what you have, Jesus. We love you so much for who you are, God. And we thank you for what you do. Amen. Come on, can we just give a round of applause for Jesus this morning? team. You know, as they're exiting the stage, I have a couple friends that are going to be making their way onto the stage. I just want to share with you guys, um, you know, I just, I felt this morning when we were prepping for our set that there was just, there were some obstructions. I don't know if you guys go outside and you're traveling down 50 and everybody has to leave the school to get to their house. There are roadblocks everywhere, right? There's detours, there's narrowing of streets, there's expanding of roads. The construction has been a pain in the butt for us drivers. And I almost feel like this morning um, that uh, the Lord just impressed upon my heart that there were some roadblocks in this area, in this, in this atmosphere, in this, in this room. And maybe that's something within our own hearts. Maybe it's, maybe it's some roadblocks within our minds. Um, I don't know what it is, but I just feel like there are strongholds that have been erected in our lives. And if that's you, um, I just want you to know that God sees you and that he is the one that can break those chains. He is the one that can destroy the barriers and that, that obstruction that stands between you and him or that stands between you and healing, you and depression, you and, you and any type of deliverance. So just be mindful that the Almighty sees you. And don't allow those roadblocks to stay in place more than what they have to, okay? Um, I have some guests, but before I introduce them to you, I want to remind 9th, 10th, and 11th, and 12th graders, you guys should be submitting your community service forms. Um, you should be having, you should be completing 12 hours per year of community service. If you do not know what that looks like, you can ask myself, you can ask anybody in the SF department. There is a link that has several different opportunities to serve in the Eagle News. You can ask your parents to show you that. There's no reason why we can't serve. Not only that, that's part of our DNA. That's who Christ created us to be. He served, we served. Amen? Okay, with that being said, um, I got some friends up here. I want to I let, let them talk to you a little bit. Hello, everybody. How are we this fine morning? Only some of us are excited to be here. I said, how are we this morning? Thank you very much. Well, we are up here today in these funky fits because this week and next week we are opening for You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown, the Spring Musical, Woo! which we have some people in the audience. Raise your hand and wave if you guys are in that. I know I got some elementary. But... Hey, hey, how you doing? Well, I'm Riley. I play Lucy. I'm Avia Wadsaker, and I play Sally Brown. Yes, and this week our show is on Thursday. We have a show at 4 p.m., and on Friday we start our 6.30 performances, and then next Thursday we have a 6.30 performance, and then the Friday after that we have another 6.30 performance. If you guys are interested in buying tickets, you guys can go to the main office right now since Mr. Langley is out, and he has had his baby, so let's all applaud for him. Yeah, congrats. 
I don't know if we're recording this, but congratulations. Um, you can buy tickets at the main office. There's also a link for tickets that is on my CLS, or you can buy them at the door if you end up forgetting. Uh, so yeah, thank you guys, and let's start chapel. Thank you. All right, with that being said, we got one of our very favorite speakers coming out today. Can you guys give a big applause for Mr. Caputo? <laughs> Uh, Mr. Caputo, I'm still taller than you. <laughs> so are half of the middle schoolers, but hey, uh, I'm used to it. Hi, everyone. How are you guys doing? Wow, I love the enthusiasm. So fantastic. Cool. Hey, uh, let's just pray real quick, and then we'll get started. So God, I thank you for this. Also, please pray with me. I know... Uh, you ever just know like you need prayer? I need prayer. So, hey, I don't want to look a fool up here today, and I need Jesus to move. And so, uh, can you guys just pray like with me, not just hear me pray, but like pray? So, hey, God, God, you are so good. God, there is nobody like you. You are holy and perfect and mighty, and I just thank you for everything that you've done for us. Uh, God, today as uh, the word is about to be preached, I just pray that you would be honored, um, God, that you would speak, not me, that you would be blessed by this time. God, that you would move in students and teachers' hearts alike. Um, God, that you would convict us in areas we need conviction. God, that you would move us in areas we need to be moved. But God, in all things, I just pray that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right, I know I said last time was supposed to be my last time speaking. I didn't know. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Anyway, uh, I'm excited to be here with you, though, and to share the word. I thought, though, today it might be fun to start off with a game. I'm not normally a fun person, and so that's different for me. Uh, and, and so let's start off with a game. I need a volunteer from a, a freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior. And so, uh, Ms. Brown, if you could pick a junior and a senior, Mr. Short, a freshman and a sophomore. And so... Guys, I need you, hear, hear me out, be a little enthusiastic, like earn your spot up here. And, and, and then second, you have to be willing to be a good loser if you come up here. And so, <laughs> you have to be a good loser if you're gonna come up here. And so, I, I need a freshman, a sophomore, a junior, and a senior. All right, come up here, and we have a game. All right, so I have some bags. Very exciting. Okay. Here, I'll, 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 uh, all right, we got, we're, we're missing a freshman, I think. I'm nice. All right, so, so here's the game, guys. I have some money in my wallet. Ooh. Now you guys all regret not being enthusiastic, I'm sure. Uh, and, and so here we go. We have, I have $40 in my wallet, okay? And here, I'm going to give each of you $10 to hold on to. Don't spend it. Just, you just hold it. You, you look at this 10 bucks and, and you, just, you just hold it, all right? Now here's the game. I have four bags up here. We're gonna start, we'll just go, go in order. So we have a freshman, Jace. Uh, don't, don't touch the bag, this, is, this isn't for you yet. You have an option. You can choose bag number one or you can keep the $10. Now, now CLS, what do you think he should do? The bag? I heard someone say the bag. I mean, ultimately the choice is yours. It's $10 or a, or a brown paper bag. Uh, and anyone, anyone, what, Jace, what do you want? Better be safe than sorry. Uh, he's gonna, he's gonna keep the 10 bucks. All right, let's see what he could have earned. All right, here we go. Oh, I taped this together better than I thought. Oh, Jace, you could have earned $20. Oh, Jace, you lost. But you still won 10 bucks, so congratulations. All right, go take a seat, all right. That's my $20. I was hoping to keep my money today. And so, uh, you know, all right, bag number two. This is for our sophomore, Natalia. Um, tell me, you have a $10 bill in your hand. What do you want, the bag or the 10 bucks? Somebody help her out. What do you want? All right, do you know what you want? I'm gonna go with the bag. You're gonna go with the bag, okay. Um, why don't you open this? Here, here, give me the $10. Open the bag up for everybody to see. And I just rip it. This is the paper bag. Uh, you just rip, rip the bag. All right, so uh, let's see. What did she win? She won a stress ball. <laughs> oh, she, who told her to pick the bag? Shame on you. Congratulations. You win a stress ball. All right, here we go. We have one more bag for the junior. Uh, you got $10 in your hand, or you can keep the bag. What do you want? 
You're tight. The bag. Oh, okay. Here, give me the ten bucks. Open it up, and tell me if you're uh, if you're gonna enjoy it. Oh, you get. Guys, I, I totally set the game how I wanted to. You get Oreos and a stress ball. Give it up for Carl. You're the winner. All right, here we go. Now the last bag, I, I, I saved the last one for the seniors because it's their last year here. And so I'm just gonna tell you right now, there's $50 in that bag. But you have, I'll tell you what, you can give me $20 or you could take the 50 bucks in the bag. Someone tell them, am I, am I lying or am I telling you the truth? That's the question. Uh, is there $50 in the bag? I said there's $50 in the bag. I don't, someone tell him, does he want the bag or does he want, or the 20 bucks? I'm gonna take the bag. All right, you open up the bag, you see what you got. What is it? Do you, do, am I a liar? I'm not a liar, there's $50 in that bag. Look at that, uh, two 20s and a 10, you win the 50 bucks, look at that. The victor is David Sisson, congrats. <laughs> Miss Brown, she's like, I earned that. Uh, I promise that's gonna make sense in like 10 minutes, what we just did, because it actually makes sense. And so, hey, way to go, those of you who won, those of you who didn't win, hey, a stress ball is more than everyone else in this school. And so you still got more than everyone else. And the Oreos, uh, Milk's favorite cookie. Anyway, so here we go. Um, I'm excited to get us started with this, this series. We're starting a series on the book of Philippians. We're actually gonna be going through it over the next three weeks. And so I hope that you guys are excited as well. We're gonna learn a lot. And I think, uh, I think many of us as a school will be challenged and grown through this series. And so I hope that you guys are excited for that. T my breath. Uh, today, I get to uh, speak. I'm gonna be reading out of Philippians 3. Uh, next week, Pastor John is going to speak, and then after that, Pastor Sam is going to speak. It's, it's Ms. Procaro's son. She's going to be the, the fan favorite, right? I bet. And so uh, we have some really exciting stuff coming up for you guys, and I hope that you guys are ready for it. Uh, with that being said, I do want us to just get right into things. So if you have a Bible, let me encourage you to open up to Philippians chapter 3. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, I will put the, the text on the screen in a bit. Um, but real quick, before we even get into the text, I actually want us to uh, take a little bit of a step back from Philippians 3. Um, I want us to study a little bit of church history. And ooh, um, you guys are all like, yeah, church history. I love it. It's my favorite thing ever, right? I know you all love church history. I love church history. Um, Ms. Brown, she loves church history. And so um, let me explain why we're going to do this. Because if you want to read the Bible, you need to read the Bible in context. You need to understand what's actually happening and why it was written the way that it was written. And so in order to understand Philippians 3, you actually have to rewind 10 years into the past, into the book of Acts chapter 16, to see the start of the Philippian church. Because if we know how it started, if we know why it started, we'll be able to read it in the way that it was meant to be read. And I, I say this a lot, and I'll say it again. If I'm up here and I'm teaching you something that's not in the Bible, then I don't have any actual authority to speak into your life. I'm just a motivational speaker, and that doesn't matter. But if I'm up here and I'm speaking from the word of God in the way that the word was meant to be presented, then I'm speaking in the authority of God, and it should change your life because God's word changes people. And that's why I want us to read from the history just a little bit today. And so, rewind 10 years before the book of Philippians was written. Paul is on his second missionary journey in Acts chapter 16, and he approaches this city called Philippi. Uh, in Philippi, it's a small city, it's Roman occupied, and it's like it's a pretty wealthy, like well-off city. Philippi's a good place to be. Uh, Paul, by the Holy Spirit, him and his companions went around and they started to preach the gospel. On a Sabbath day, they go down by the lake or the river and they see these women praying and they're saying, oh, here we go, it's time to share the gospel. And so Paul shares the gospel with these people that are praying by a river. Uh, and there's this one woman, her name is Lydia, and she responds to the gospel in a powerful way. And she's like, wow, this gospel that Paul just presented is amazing. And so she gives her life to Jesus. Lydia, uh, she was a pretty cool person because she was loaded. She dealt in purple dyes. She was a businesswoman. So the first person to hear the gospel in Philippi was a rich woman who was ready to use her money to help spread the gospel even further. God had a plan for that. After Lydia hears the gospel, it goes on, and Paul 
He's just walking down the road, and he's ready to share the gospel with more people. And out of nowhere, this demon-possessed girl just comes up to Paul and starts screaming crazy stuff. Like, like you know, it's just your typical Saturday, the demon-possessed girl, and she knows, like, like, that's what happens, right? And so this demon-possessed girl, she comes up, and she starts screaming craziness right around Paul. And Paul, he's, a, he's like, he doesn't take that. He's like, nah, not today, demon. He says, get away. And he just casts this demon right out of the girl, right in the middle of the street. And, and something happens, though, because here's the thing. This, this girl who was possessed, she was a slave, and her own actually made a lot of money from this demon that was in her because it would fortune tell, essentially go up to people and tell them what was happening in their life. So these slave owners, they were mad. They're like, whoa, there's my money. What am I going to do now? And so they grab Paul, they take him before the city, and they say, hey, this guy is causing problems in our city. We need to do something. And so like as is typical fashion for Paul, he gets beat up and thrown into prison. Like, what a day, right? I cast a demon out and I get thrown in jail for it? Like, that's what happened to Paul. So he goes to prison, uh, and, and the authorities, they talk to the prison guard, and they say, hey, I need you to put him safely in prison until we figure out what to do with him. The jailer, in his, like, genius, what does he do? He's like, oh, I think what they meant by putting Paul safely in prison was to lock him up in the stocks. Now, uh, when you see stocks, like, if you ever watch a video, like, where they put their hands and their head through, like, the wood and they're stuck and people throw vegetables, like, that's kind of what the stocks were like in those prisons, but a lot worse. Like, your body would get contorted in weird angles and they would make you suffer and be in pain. And so Paul's in prison. He's in the stocks, him and his friends, and, and sure enough... Uh, as Paul tends to do, he doesn't do what they want him to do. What does he do? Some of you guys know the story. He starts singing praises to God in the middle of this Philippian prison. And God does something amazing. He frees Paul from the stocks, from the shackles that he was in, and, and he is able to escape. However, Paul does not escape, but the jailer didn't know that. The jailer thought that Paul was going to run away, and so the jailer was actually going to take his own life because he's like, well, if my prisoner escapes, I'm as good as dead. Before the jailer can take his own life, Paul's like, stop, stop, stop. I'm here. I'm here. Like, I care about you, jailer. Even though you were mean to me, I care about you. He stops the jailer from taking his own life, and the jailer and his family now put their faith in Jesus. Once again, the Philippian church grows. After this, Paul begins to leave Philippi, and he moves on, and the Philippian church is started by a really weird group of people. It's like a rich business lady, an angry jailer, and a slave girl, maybe, who was possessed by a demon. All of these people who encountered God were the ones who were able to start the Philippian church. And, and it's so cool because if you fast forward 10 years, we get to the book of Philippians where Paul wrote a letter to them from prison. It's like full circle. They saw him suffering in prison. They saw him loving Jesus in prison. They saw him moving in the Holy Spirit uh, in prison. And then 10 years later, this church has grown into something actually really significant. They're reaching people with the gospel. They're doing what God has called them to do. But they hear that Paul is going through a hard time. They're like, oh, he is stuck in a Roman prison. And so they send him a gift to encourage him. And Paul writes back. And, and so the whole book of Philippians is really Paul writing to these people who he cared for, to this church that he started. Uh, and he's writing it from a Roman prison. Now, what's super cool about this is this. Maybe not cool, I guess that's probably not the best term, but as Paul is writing this letter to the Philippians, he actually suspects that he might die soon. Like when you read through the book, you see it. He's like, I, I might not have too much longer. He doesn't know for sure, but if you study history, you actually see that Paul would soon be executed by the Roman prison uh, or by the Romans because of his work with the gospel. And so, so this is where we pick up, and I want us to look today in Philippians chapter 3, understanding that they knew Paul suffered, they knew Paul loved Jesus, and that Paul was able to start something great in their city. That matters to us as we read through this. And so what we're going to look at today specifically is going to be Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 11. Um, if we could put that on the screen, I want to read that for you guys, and then we'll discuss. And so, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness, that, or righteousness from God that depends on faith. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection and share in his suffering, becoming like him in his death. That by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection of the dead. 
I want to explain this passage to you guys because there's a lot that we can learn. And I think if we look at this passage and let it shape our lives, we'll be different people as we leave this room today. So first, let me explain just the first uh, verses one through six right before this. I'm just going to give you a quick summary. Paul, he's talking to a group of people called the Judaizers. Uh, some of you may have heard that term before. Essentially, the Judaizers are these like pretty radical group of Jews. They wanted the Christians to follow Jewish practice. They're like, if you want to be a Christian, you have to be a Jew first. Pretty much that's what they said. It's like, that doesn't make sense. Uh, and so Paul, he, he approaches these Judaizers and he says, hey, you need to understand something. We're saved by grace, not by works. If you want to be righteous, it's because of what Jesus did in your life and nothing else. And how does Paul argue for this? He goes, well, in verses 1 through 6, he starts to list all of these things he's good at. He's like, do you know who I am? I'm Paul. He's like, I was a Pharisee. I'm smart. I had a lot of people listen to me. I have more schooling than you do. I did more good than you did. I follow the law. I am a Jew of Jews. And Paul's like, I know what I'm doing. But in verse 7, and this is what I want us to understand, Paul has all of these amazing qualifications. He says, but whatever gain I had, I count as a loss for the sake of knowing Jesus. That is a powerful line. Like, like, like really powerful. Let me explain to you guys, because here's the deal. I think a lot of times we read stuff like this and we're like, oh, that's good. And then we just move on and don't let anything happen. This is a passage that should change your life today. And so let me tell you why. Like I said, Paul had a lot to be proud of. Like he was a smart dude. Like some people say trilingual, like he knew three languages. He could speak them fluently. He wrote, if you read his letters, you just see like the theology and the richness of how he writes. Like Paul is a smart dude. He was highly respected by the Pharisees. Like he had influence. So he's like the dude that everyone loved. Like culturally today, we're like, ew, Pharisees. Back then they're like, whoa, a Pharisee. So Paul was loved by the people. He was smart. He had influence. He was probably pretty well off. Like, he had authority. People listened to him. If he wanted something to happen, it would happen. Like, Paul had everything, like all that he could want. And what did he say about all of this stuff? He said, it's a loss. I have the world, but it is all a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ. Like, this is the dude who they knew had it all. And he says, it's nothing. I want you guys to put yourself in Paul's shoes for just a second. Like, like, think from the perspective of Paul. Here you are. You're on top of the world. You're rich. You got money. You got fame. Everyone loves you. You can do what you want. People listen to you. Like, you got it all. All of a sudden, you hear this message about Jesus. And you're like, whoa, I've been trying to kill Christians. But, th but then something strikes a chord in you, and you're like, this message is true. There's something about Jesus. And so what you do is this. You say, well, I, I guess I heard this message. It's changed me now. I need to do what the Bible tells, what, or says, what Jesus says, and I need to go out and start sharing this message with others. And so you went from the person who had everything, but now you start to talk to people about the love and the hope and the grace of Jesus, and you start to tell people about their sin, and they don't like it. Like, like people don't like when you confront their sin. And so, so Paul comes up, and he starts to tell people about their sin. Here you are, and you start to tell them, and, and they don't like you now. And from having everything, now the people that once loved you are beating you, and they're hurting you, and they're, like, really hurting you. They're throwing you in prison. They're using all these terrible words at you, and you're like, I had it all. I gave it up, and now this is what I have. I'm in prison. I'm getting beat. I'm getting hurt. What's going on? But you realize something. You're like, oh, wait, but I have Jesus. Maybe this prison isn't so bad. Maybe these blows to my body aren't so bad. Maybe the, the words that people speak to me aren't so bad because I have Jesus. And there's nothing a single person on this planet could ever do that could take away from the fact that I have Jesus. This is the story that Paul goes through. His friends, they probably looked at him. They're like, you fool. You had the world. You had everything you could ever wanted. Don't you know who you could have been? Don't you know what you could have done? Like, you had it all. Why did you give it up? The response, well, I didn't lose anything. I didn't lose anything at all. In fact, in fact, I think I'm the biggest winner that this world has ever found because I found Jesus. That's the response that Paul has. And my question for you, CLS, is do you believe that this is true? Do you believe that Jesus is actually the most significant thing that this world could ever offer? Is there something greater than Jesus in your life? Because these words in Philippians are not just the ramblings of a madman. Like, like, like I said, Paul like, knew what he was doing. The Philippians saw Paul. 
They saw him in prison. They saw him sing to God in prison. They knew that what he was saying was legitimate because he'd proved it through the way that he lived his life. They knew that he wasn't just being like, well, now I'm in prison, so it doesn't matter anymore. No, like he was in prison because he really loved Jesus, and it had nothing to do with what the world could offer. Paul knew what he was talking about, and he knew what he was doing. In CLS, I want us to be a school that adopts this mentality that Paul had, that we would be a school that says, yeah, the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus, nothing compares to that. How do we do this? It's like, it's, it's all about this mentality, guys. Like when you read through scripture, you see the mentality that Paul had because it's all about this relationship with Jesus, one that's built on hope. It's this hope that we have in Christ that it's about a righteousness that's not our own. The fact that we can be made new, that we can be forgiven, and that we have nothing to do with it. It's this hope of a life after death and the best life that a person could ever experience, that there's nothing comparable to it. Like, this relationship with Jesus offers a hope that the world could never offer. There's no fame, no power, no lust, no drug, no anything that could ever compare to knowing Jesus. There's no job, there's no career, no like amount of money, no success, nothing at all compares to knowing Jesus because he offers something that the world can't and it is a supernatural gift that only he can give. He can make us new and he can give us life. This is what Paul talks about in Romans or Philippians. What am I talking about? It's kind of like that game that we played at the beginning. Like, like I, I want to bring us back to that, just this object lesson really quick. Here's the deal. In front of us, we have a lot of options, and we all have something to start with. Like, we have something that we have, right? We might not know what's in the bag in front of us, and we're like, ooh, this world, it has something good to offer me. I want to I wanna follow what the world says. And we, we make these trades and exchanges with the world. And sometimes we win, and sometimes we end up with a stress ball. But here's the thing. At the end of our life... There's only one prize that actually matters. It's the grand prize. It's that $50 bill, right? It's the 50 bucks. And in, in the world, there's a lot of things to offer, and we gamble our lives away pretty frivolously sometimes, thinking that what the world has to offer is all that really matters. And we make these trades, and we expect to get good stuff. And honestly, sometimes you do get good stuff. Like, hey, sometimes you walk away with 10 bucks, and that's happy, right? But at the end of it all... Here's the truth, guys. Even if you got $10, you're still probably thinking like, ooh, that 50 bucks would have been nice. In life, we can get a lot of good things, but if we don't have Jesus, we're missing out. There's nothing compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus. You might be successful. You might have a lot of friends. You might have a lot of good things. But at the end of your life, the only thing that you're going to want is Jesus. Paul continues in verses 12 through 16, and we're almost done. Let me just read this. Uh, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, uh, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining, straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way and if in everything or anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you also. Only let us hold on to what is true or to what we have attained. So here's the deal. What Paul is saying essentially is this. He says, hey, if anyone can make a brag, if anyone can claim that they're good enough to earn God, it's Paul. He says, I could do that, but I recognize that I'm nowhere near good enough. Like He's like, I've done it all, and I'm not good enough, but I have Jesus. That's what he says. He says, I can move forward because of the hope I have in Jesus. He says, I can uh, leave it all behind, right? He can leave everything else behind because he has Jesus. His accomplishments, his suffering, the prison, the fact that he knows he's probably going to be executed, it doesn't matter because he has Jesus. Like, that's all that matters. And I know I'm saying Jesus a lot today because I don't want you to miss the point. All that matters in your life is Jesus. Like, like hear me out, CLS. That is all that matters. You can win a lot of prizes, but at the end of your life, you will only care about one, and that's Jesus. And so here's the thing, CLS. I just want to end it with this. My question for you is this. Do you choose Jesus above everything else? Do you? Or are you going to gamble your life away and pick a bag that you hope is going to offer you some type of satisfaction that ultimately is going to leave you disappointed? Is it Jesus or the world? No family, no job, nothing compares. Like generation, guys, generation to generation before us, they've discovered the hope of Jesus. 
Like all of these people, they've given up so much for the kingdom of God because they discovered, yes, what God has to offer is good. And so I just would ask you guys, will you join the countless generations of believers before us and say all that matters is Jesus? Um, at the very beginning of Philippians, Paul says this. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. This is the passage I want to let you guys think of. What is the her- purpose of your life? Is it Christ? Because if you die for Christ, if you give it all up, you've won it all. Like there is nothing that compares. Uh, the greatest tragedy in any person's life is living a life without Jesus. And I want you guys today to seriously think what comes first in your life. Is it Jesus or the world? Because there's one prize that you will ultimately care about. Let's pray and then I'll dismiss you. God. Uh, there is no one like you. God, nothing compares to the prize that we have in you. And I pray today that students would not gamble their lives with things that are insignificant, that people would give up everything they have for you because you are truly the one that is worthy. God, may there be no object, no person, no hope, no dream that comes before you because you are truly all that matters. And so, Jesus, I pray that in this school, in these students' lives, that you Uh, would be made famous. Jesus, that we would put you before all else. God, that we'd be a school that's known for loving you. I pray this in your name. Amen. All right. uh, I think we got to go. So freshmen and seniors, you can go. And upstairs, you guys can go too. Uh, eighth graders, you guys can go. Eighth graders? Juniors, you can go, and sophomores, why not? Farewell, everyone, go.